Hey guys, and welcome back to The Ground Up Show. I'm your host, Matt Diavella, and today my guest is comedian Todd Glass. You might have seen Todd in his Netflix comedy special, Act Happy, or listened to his podcast, The Todd Glass Show. This conversation is so much fun from the start. Uh, what you will learn is that Todd is very enthusiastic about minimalism. Just be able to apply it instantly, you know, it was fun. And I couldn't stop. And everyone looked at me like I was a maniac. I go, no, you don't understand. I'm not doing this in some carefree way. If, if I have even a question mark next to it, I don't get rid of it. On this episode, we talk about Todd's journey into minimalism and letting go of stuff, the two mantras that he uses to help guide his minimalist philosophy, as well as knowing when to hold on to things and when to let them go. It's a great episode and I hope you like it. What do you what do you want to talk about today? How uh, do you know? No. I feel well, like you probably uh, wanted to, you, you have some things to say. Only one thing. Just First one of thing. all, I said it on the phone to you. Love the documentary. And I know you talk about more than that on the podcast, but I, it changed my life. And uh, I was already organized. I was already organized. And I think that's what I think a lot of people think when they well, when they would when I would tell them I saw that documentary, they would all go, "Yeah, but you're already." I go, "No, no, it's more than just being organized." Um, everything in my house was organized, but there was stuff I didn't need. And I asked my friend when he wanted me to watch it, he goes, you got to watch this documentary on minimalism. And I said, will it give me a mantra? Because I really need a mantra. And he goes, yes. And it did. And that was the, does this add purpose to my life? Which I learned could be aesthetics. Because mm. there were certain things, oh, I like the way that makes that room look. Sometimes it was that. Uh, but a lot of times, I don't even want to bore you with so many things that there were that... I got rid of, and it was hard. It was some things were hard. Like I'll give you, I will give you a few if you even want a few examples. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I had like thirty chairs that I would save for when I had a dinner, which is not that often anymore. In my old relationship, we'd have big dinners, and even then, it wasn't that important. But at least we had dinners, and I had thirty matching chairs with covers that someone gave to me. So there'd be a big set table with thirty chairs. They all match, and yet look cool. People go out in your backyard, but. I don't have every three years maybe and, and they take up room and and then I was at someone's house years ago and these little salt and pepper shakers every person had them and you know of course I was about 20 when I saw that at my friend's <laughs> house and they were rich you know and yeah. every person had their own salt and pepper shaker so I became obsessed with that those uh, okay you're not using them get, get rid of them um, I had a wine, wine craft you know you're at a restaurant and there's a you put a wine in it with the ice carafe, yeah, yeah. and I thought I thought, oh, I'll be... I go, and then when I saw the documentary, the next day I went, you're never using those. Not once a year, not once every three years. And that stuff just started flying out of my house, like left and right. And if it was on the fence, I didn't get rid of it. That's the amazing part. I, I, I go, everything I got rid of was not difficult. If I went, oh, I'm not sure, then keep it. But start with, absolutely not, absolutely not. Get rid of it, get rid of it, get rid of it, get rid of it. Through Taking stuff to the thrift store, you know? Or if I'm lazy, I leave it outside of my gym because I know someone will take clothes. Like I'll just leave it on a bench and I'll put a take mm. take for a good home, you know. But here's the this is my only, if you want to say it, an agenda. Two things that I, when I tell people, I always tell people, watch the documentary. And here's two things that I add. One, when you get rid of stuff, sometimes something you get rid of, just call it Murphy's Law, you'll need in three weeks. So what? Don't have that have you go on a backwards backwards spiral of you don't want to get rid of stuff. I got rid of those knobs. I needed them. Oh, that 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 connector, that hose valve, or whatever it is. It's not about the one thing that you get rid of that you need. Okay, you'll go rebuy it. But what about the other 95 things you got rid of that you never needed? So just because there maybe is one thing you got rid of and a month later you need it, so what? There's one thing that helps me because mm -hmm. that happened. That happened, but I thought, so what? There's 95 other things. And the other thing is taking pictures of things that do mean something to you. Now, not everything. I have some things for my dad. I don't want a picture of the item. I want the item, and that I keep, a jacket of his. But other things I felt guilty for getting rid of. Uh, maybe it could be something that a fan gave me that I do value. I do value. I, 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 I can't, not I won't, I can't just throw it out. I can't do it. Maybe if you're 
you know, someone that gets hundreds of things a day. Okay, I get it. Mm -hmm. But so I would take a picture of it and it would be in the book. And I actually saw it more in the book than I did if I had the item in a drawer. That really helped me. Mm -hmm. I went through, took a picture of that. It's in the book. Every year I print out a book. But even if you don't, just take a picture of it. And I would just, um, you know, I was going around my house just taking pictures of things. Okay, oh, I feel bad about getting rid of that knickknack. My mom got it for me right. for Christmas. Took a picture of it. So I was, and if you look at my book, you know, every year I, you know, go on Apple or whatever, iTunes, and I print out a book from all the pictures in my phone. Uh, I see those things so often more now than I did when they were in a drawer. And I told a friend about this. And I forgot when him and his girlfriend were over my house, they were looking through my book. I already told them about when you don't, something means something to you. And I remember they're turning the page and I go, oh my God, that thing they gave me is in the book. And sure enough, they turned the page before I could even think it. They were turning the page before I could finish my thought. They, yeah. they were on that page. They weren't even upset. They went, oh, this made it in the book. They just cared that it meant something enough for me to be in the book. Not that that's a reason to do it or not do it, but. Anyway, side note there. But I think that's probably people's like biggest fear. And like I, I get that still as well is like getting gifts is, is difficult. It's easier now because people see me as a minimalist. My family knows. But still come Christmas or the holidays, like my mom still likes getting me gifts and she'll get me like my name inscribed on this little ornament for a, like a tree ornament. And, you know, we don't usually have a tree. And even if we did, do we want to have like collecting a hundred ornaments every year? So I think that's a great alternative to be able to still cherish and look back at that thing, but then also to get rid of it. But the biggest fear is that the people are going to be upset with you. you exactly. And I dealt with it with funny. You mentioned that with your mom, because I, I thought of a great way to, to, I it just came upon me naturally to deal with my mom with, I don't want mom at Christmas. I know you get a lot of joy out of it. So when I, after I saw the documentary, Christmas had come around and my mom had bought me, again, some knickknacks and stuff. And I said, Mom, no. I said, I'm being honest with you, but it was perfect for the last knickknack you ever bought me. I go, I truly love it. And I do. I'm being honest. And between me and you, I did. I really liked it. I go, but after this, no more. Hmm. I just, I, I saw this movie. I saw this, uh, the documentary on minimalism. I told her she should watch it. She goes, oh, I don't really... It's funny the delusion of people. She goes, "Oh, I don't really, uh, I don't really need that. I'm, I'm already. I throw out everything. I overthrow <laughs> out stuff. Now my mom's house is crazy neat, but every single closet, and it's only her and her husband, and they live in a, a fairly large house that a four kid people with four kids could live in, and every single closet, including the basement closets, is packed. But in her head." She's a, she doesn't have a lot of stuff, but that's why I like the documentary because it doesn't turn into an argument. She go, and I go, she goes and she started getting like defending herself. I go, oh mom, mom, mom! I watched the documentary for me. I wasn't insinuating for you. I go, it's just whoever feels they need it. I'm not like throwing it upon you, but I was not being totally forthright. I just didn't want to. You know, well, yeah, there's, there's it's, truth to what I said, but there's also like I was I wanted to go, oh, my God, even affectionately, like a conversation between a mom or two friends go, are you shitting me? You really don't think you guys are, are, <laughs> have uh, stuff packed in every drawer and everything. Yeah, everybody thinks that uh, they don't have a problem. It's very hard to see our own problem, especially with our stuff, because we're so attached to it. People like really even like you were saying, when you were going through your stuff and trying to figure out what you needed and what you didn't. There's a real connection to it, and it's hard to start to let that go, mm -hmm. especially if it becomes a part of our home. We see it every right. day. It's there. To get rid of it, it's, is, it's very difficult. I did it with VHS tapes. About five years ago, I told a friend of mine that's an editor. I had, you know, if I did a show, they give you, they used to give you a VH tape 20 years ago, VHS tape, you know, or back when it turned into a DVD. And I had them all, and I told a friend of mine, I said, if I put these all in bags, shopping bags, and I give them to you, when you have a slow month, like maybe you have two weeks, you're like, I don't have any jobs, and you want to make, let's say, $500. That's what I said. If mm -hmm. it's less or more, tell me, but that's what I'm throwing out there, to spend two days or three days. And so sure enough, he had the bags for two months, and one day he called me. He goes, it's all done. I did it. I labeled it. If it was a VHS tape and it had a one-minute appearance when you were on a show, I, he took the one minute off. Mm. And he put them all on a hard drive and DVDs, dropped them all at my front door, and left the VHS tapes and all the DVDs with it. I'm like, no, <laughs> this is the hardest part. I go, yeah. oh, my God, please come back and get them. So I put them in the trash. 
I put them, but this really does show how hard it is to get rid of stuff. I knew that they were in there and I knew I didn't want to get all of them, but oh, maybe that one that, and I literally, this sounds crazy, but I didn't want to be able to go back into the trash and get them. So I took some Clorox because this was like a Monday and they don't pick my trash up the Friday and I just poured it over it. I went there. Now you don't have to think about it. They're done. They're gone. You know, because it is, it's hard. I didn't need any of those things. So, right. And this is something that's like a, almost like an interesting uh, difference there because it is a physical object, but also what's on it digital is something, or it can be made digital and it can be, right. it can be kept because, uh, I mean, a lot of people talk about, at least within the minimalism space, uh, digital clutter and like, it's, it's very hard to keep that stuff organized and, and, but I think having a system and keeping those old stand-up tapes or keeping for me like keeping my films from when I was in high school that's really cool to look back on yeah yeah that's why I don't want to over get rid of stuff so I just thought I do want that and now by the way now that they're all on digital and a hard drive uh, I look at them more I will mm -hmm. they're clean and they're organized but uh, yeah it's very some stuff I was convincing myself meant something to me when it didn't you know, I'm not defying that I have physical things that I want to hold on to from my dad. My dad died when I was like 24. But like one thing was like this razor and it was the razor he used. It's an old Atra razor and I had it and I went, this doesn't really, I don't need this. I'm just convincing myself that I, this has anything to do with him at all. So. Yeah. I think until you actually take the time to say, all right, this weekend, like I need to start going through at least one drawer or one room, one yeah. closet, and then just take it little by little because it can be overwhelming. And it's, it's almost that one of those tasks that you can just keep pushing off forever. Mm -hmm. But the thing is like for most of us, most Americans, especially we just start accumulating stuff subconsciously. Like it just comes into our house. We get Amazon mm -hmm. deliveries. We're rarely throwing stuff out or decluttering unless we actually set the intention to do so. Exactly. And that's what the movie did. That the movie documentary did for me. And uh, just, and you know what, a few other things real quick. Cause I always think, I know how good it felt for me to watch the documentary and then apply it with, with just be able to apply it instantly. You know, mm. it was fun Yeah. and I couldn't stop. And everyone looked at me like I was a maniac. I go, no, you don't understand. I'm not doing this in some carefree way. If, if I have even a question mark next to it, I don't get rid of it. It's not me sitting there. The first round was just very easy. But also with my toolbox, I have a toolbox and I, I don't, I don't, I didn't know what was in there, what was in it. I'm not going on site where I need a toolbox. I, so I took, you know, those plastic shoe trees that you can hang on a door and each one is clear. So you can put a shoe in it, yeah. it holds 20 shoes or 24 shoes. I have that hanging in the, in the in my laundry room behind the door, and that's my toolbox now. Mm. And I love it because I can see there's the screwdrivers, there's the pliers, there's everything that can fit in a shoe tree. Now, if I had a saw that couldn't, I left that in the toolbox. But mm. there's like four things in the toolbox now. But the shoe tree I can see, and I really like it. And I also do that. I don't believe in junk drawers because you don't know what's in there. So I have a shoe tree that is my equivalent to a junk drawer. And you can see every pouch. There's scotch tape, there's birthday candles, there's batteries, there's, so I call it my shoe tree junk drawer. And that for me is very cleansing. I always know where stuff is now because- yeah. Doesn't it feel good? I feel it like it's great. It, it, it's it's a, like a weight. It is, a, it's, it's, there's not one thing in my house now that even my, I have a podcast studio. And although it was neat and although it was clean and very organized, things were in drawers. I had mm. a few old drawers that I had in my podcast studio and in there was everything. But I forgot what was in there. Where's that cord? Where's that? I put pegboard in my storage area, not just one piece. The carpenter goes, oh, one piece. That'll be enough. You get those hooks. You hang everything on plastic clear bags. So there's your microphones. There's your wires. There's those kazoos you might use for that bit. But they were in drawers. Very I forgot. Now, not one drawer, not even the cabinets. I threw the cabinets out. They're not in drawers. They're on the pegboard. And when I walk into that garage, that wall of pegboard, I see every little thing I want. The other day, someone goes, you know what? We're going on the road to do my show. And one of the guys in the band goes, you better bring those little portable lights so we can see some of our sheet music. I knew where it was because I pass by it every single day when I'm going in that garage. I see every bag of stuff. And it, oh my God, it's... Wow, it's great. 
it's so much fun. It is. It's, I think you have to have a system in place because then stuff accumulates, especially with like surfaces. You have tables or if you have end tables, uh, desks. Desks tend to just paperwork piles up on top of it. Uh, but you need to have a system where you're like, all right, well, I'm going to put this here in this maybe in this corner of my desk and every week I will, I will go through it. Or for my camera gear, I have like tons of camera gear and I don't want this stuff to be out all the time. So I have a system like, okay, this goes into this cabinet, this goes in this drawer, this goes in this drawer. And I just know that's where I put it every time. But even before that, I didn't have a system. Even when we first moved into this apartment, it was like very chaotic. I would just put stuff on shelves and it would be wires tangled over top of each other. And it just like made me feel uncomfortable. Right. I don't know if it's a problem. It's not, I feel like it's not, um, it's more of like a, like I said, a weight or just a, like a kind of a background gnawing being like, ah, I really need to like clean that out. I really need to do that. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's not like OCD, like I have to fix it right now, but it's definitely when I'm clear, when my clutter, when I'm, my apartment isn't cluttered, I feel a lot better. And I feel like I can be more productive. There's this like mentality of like the, the, the artist that there's paperwork everywhere, but I feel like it if doesn't it works have to be that them, way. Yeah. That, that's why I always like that part in your movie where you said the guy with the books, yeah. my, my rendition of it's funny, <laughs> your rendition of it changes as you keep repeating it. My rendition of that, which is probably off, I probably I amped it up a little was the guy going, oh, I loved your documentary, but I have a lot of books and the books and I love my books. And I don't know what to do, but I really appreciated your documentary, but I have these books and I share them with my friends. Stop, sir. Stop. Sounds like these books had a lot of purpose to your life. Mm -hmm. Then keep them. Yeah, there's not one rule for everybody, you know? That's why I'm not really crazy about feng shui because I do agree with a lot of the things in there. But you know what? If you're in a small apartment in New York, maybe maybe you need things under your bed. Mm -hmm. And this, So you can't just have, oh, no, feng shui says no things under your bed. Maybe they're under there in perfect baskets and folded, all the clothes you don't wear in the summer, but it's so organized under your bed where it doesn't represent, yeah, you don't want clutter under your bed maybe. Unless you like clutter under your bed, then, then that's great too. We're just, this for me is like if you, like I was talking to my brother about it and he loved it and he now stuck something in my head. He goes, you want to hear one of mine? He goes, you know, when it comes to fi files, he goes, fuck miscellaneous. And I go, you son of a bitch. I have my miscellaneous file. And he's right. Yeah. Miscellaneous. He goes, if I lose something, I'm on the road. And he goes, and I tell someone to go into my desk and open my file cabinet, there's no miscellaneous. Even if it's one thing in a folder, great. Label it. It's one thing in the folder. Um, you know, it could be a title to car or whatever. You know, one thing. Okay, fine. Mm -hmm. So I love that he, like, that gave me something else. Yeah, I don't want, fuck miscellaneous. Fuck miscellaneous, that's really so good. So I went and took my miscellaneous folder out of my file and just added six more, and they each got its own little clean file. Yeah. The one thing I think people have trouble with, uh, like we were talking about, even with our, our moms, is, like, dealing with the, the stuff people give us, but it's also, like, being in relationships with people who maybe don't aren't as conscious or aware about the stuff that's in their life. Um, my girlfriend is certainly not a minimalist. And when we first moved in together, that was kind of a, it was, there was some friction there. Like there were times I would make some like throwaway comments, like where I'm like, mm, maybe we should get rid of the TV as in like, cause like I, I like experimenting and I like, like, Oh, let's just get rid of that because we could always buy it again later, but it might be nice. Cause maybe then I'll spend more time listening to podcasts. Maybe I'll be more productive. I won't be as distracted. And she, she was very upset. <laughs> she did not want to get rid of the TV. And then I was like, uh, okay, that's, you know, that's fine. We, we don't have to get rid of the TV. That's totally cool. Maybe we can get rid of the cable. And then it's coming to these little compromises. And I think what it came down to was just having respect for each other and, and listening to each other and understanding that maybe we value different things. I have a lot of camera gear. She has maybe more shoes than me and a penguin Snuggie. But like, that's <laughs> totally cool. Like, that's like, she loves that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I encourage her to buy things that add value to her life and that she loves. But yeah. um, it, I, I do hear from a lot of people who struggle with that. Yeah, it's, it's so funny you bring up being in a relationship because I was in a relationship and uh, it, it ended after 13 years for whatever it's worth. We are uh, amazingly, uh, we get along great. And that's nice when somebody was in your life for 13 years that now they're not in, you know, you're not dating them anymore, but they're still, they're still uh, important to you. But I always said, look, it, I'm not implying that it was the, well, the relationship was great and it ended. That's, that's just what happened. So there's really, it was a, a journey to get through that point where we've become friends again, but it didn't take that long. Hmm. But, um, he, again, far from a hoarder. That's the whole thing. No, no, we're even close. Not a hoarder. Like not a, 
But he had so many things that when we broke up that I did think in the back of my head, even in the first week, oh, that'll be sort of nice. <laughs> and it, at the back of my head, all the, the, uh, the CDs and cases, CDs, cases and cases of CDs, some didn't have them, some did. It bothered me to get rid of those and shelves and shelves and shelves of DVDs and and um and vhs's every single one of them gone every single one of them gone i thought if i need any I'll, it's a digital age and boy did that clear my back of my head just tons of that crap perfectly organized on shelves but still gone so nice it is it, it is nice i think that's like something that everybody goes through at the end of a breakup too because the things remind you of that person too and especially at the the end and in that transition point I think at least for me like I need some step away time where I'm like I just need to like be on my own for a little bit and Mm -hmm. just get my head clear and it's kind of hard if you're always reminded of that person especially with social media it's so much harder now where it's like maybe I block that person for a little (laughs) bit (laughs) but then but like yeah if it's like a long relationship if somebody's with you for a long period of time it, I think, grows beyond a point of just being an intimate relationship. It's like there's a bond there that's like it's amazing if you can make it work. Yeah, it certainly that. easier. And in some cases, people can't. Yeah. Legitimately can't. Not because they're being selfish. The person they were with might have some, you know, whatever, alcohol problem or something. Yeah. But in my case, it wasn't that. But it was nice to, to not have a lot of that stuff. And, and then you just can't stop. You know, now I'm like, I realize I had a big old desk. From like 1980, where you needed a desk with drawers and things. And I, one day I went, I just got rid of the desk. Someone goes, have a, have a yard sale. I'm like, you know what? I'll give it to charity. Because now, during this minimalization project, who doesn't give enough to charity? What a great reason to get rid of stuff yeah. and not mind if you need to buy it again. You gave it to charity. Got rid of the desk. All my beds in my house. Now, this really has nothing to do with minimalization in a way, but it, it's what got me there. I put, there's these things you can put under the legs so they slide. Even the biggest bed in the world can slide. So now they slide back so I can clean behind them easier. It's not a mm. thing. One of my beds, so it didn't rock, I had bolted to the wall. And then I, when I unbolted it from the headboard, I looked behind there. And it was, I mean, I'm a crazy clean person. It was legitimately filthy behind there. Took the bolt out of the wall, braced the bed so it didn't need to be bolted into a two by four. And then clean behind there got rid of the desk now i have a cool little retro desk that with a finger because it has felt under all the, the yeah. legs i wanted everything to be able to be moved with just a finger like just slides out can clean behind there so it's that like there's really intention there it's like too. a lot of thought about those kind of decisions i feel like most of the time we don't think these things through we just like see oh that's nice let me get that but it's like is it going to fit in the space that i have right i'm i'm watching during this whole process i i have a duplex and i rent to people upstairs and a girl just moved in and her parents must have some money because she's like 21 years old she has a roommate they're great mm-hmm. i love them up there but she's in the opposite end she's just buying like i say this affectionately sure. but whenever i see stuff they're bringing up i go she's just buying shit buying shit now i'm not saying everything of course people buy things they need no one is no one's defying that but whenever i see stuff getting delivered tables and chairs and just shit (laughs) so that's our joke is like she just keeps buying shit because she doesn't know that might keep her there like she might have a job that she doesn't want to take just because now it represents all that crap she has to move so that's in the back of your head i told my nephew i go tyler just don't buy anything. Just be able to, if, if two years, something, you'll, you'll know when it's time and you really want to settle down. And that doesn't mean your house can't be nice. You can still have clean and orderly, you know? So what was your re- relationship with stuff uh, before watching the doc, before like starting to think about this? Because you said you were organized. Um, but I'm curious about like just uh, living in a society that's pretty consumerist Um and our, this focus on stuff, especially as like material signals of success, did that ever f- play a factor for you? Or generally, uh, I, I guess I'm just curious about what your relationship with stuff was before. I mean, I think it was like a lot of other people. I was always just buying like, does it fit was my question. Oh, do I need, and now it's like, I'm not saying I don't buy things, but I'll tell you what, I'm much more careful. There's still some things I buy, mm. but I would just, what was something, you know what? And you realize 
I hope this is answering your question. I put a little guest house in my backyard, just a guest room. They still come into the house. It's so close to the house for the bathroom. And there's, you know, it's like if I had friends in from out of town, they could have at least their own bedroom, you know, in their own space. But I was thinking about putting a bathroom in there. And I went, no, that's going to need repair. And it's going to need to be, I don't want another thing to have to take care of, you know. And my, this might be telling you way too much. My obsession now is, like, I'm happy in my home. And if I live there forever, I'm great. But since I watched the documentary, <laughs> my new obsession is, like, if I could build the perfect house, it would be as much cement as possible. No grout. You know what I mean? Like even in your bathrooms, after 30 years, the grout starts going. You're like, yeah, that tile, I got to, everything as, what do you call it? Like, no, um, no maintenance. Mm-hmm. Cement, no uh, air ducts, not hid. Just you know, going going through the ceiling. You know, open seal. That way, if right to fix it, if yeah. it needs to be fixed, oh, that, I don't have to take down a wall. The electricity, I don't mind if it's a it's a you know a, an industrial type looking house, maybe lofty. The electricity along the walls, no, it's outside. If something breaks, it's everything is there. It's almost like yeah. the pegboard, but mm-hmm. it's the house. Now, I'm probably not going to be able to do that in my lifetime, but it is my weird fantasy. That would be the perfect house for me, that the landscaping outside is little as possible, just clean, and everything is just easy to get to. There's, yeah. no, there's no wall to have to rip down if a pipe breaks or anything. I have that kind of fantasy, too, about like creating a home that's like self-sustaining, mm-hmm. that like isn't like is solar paneled and has all the, everything built into it. Um, I don't know. It's just, it's like a fun project. And it's like one of those things in the back of my mind where I'm like, right now, not possible at all to do that, but especially in, in a place like LA. Like it's like, unless right. you were to like go to Montana and just like do it as a side project. Right. Uh, it's very uh, hard to close. I, yeah. I always say I want to live on the grid because I'm, you know, I want electricity. I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm that, but as little as is on the grid but as off the grid as you can. Like, have your cars paid for. Mm-hmm. If you're going to have a car paid for, and then maybe you keep putting away money for your next car. It's like, I know that's what my aunt and uncle used to do. I thought that was cool. They go, yeah, we have no car payment. But just try to, like, you know, just uh, just have it as simple and, and clean and nothing like. There's a home on Melrose that I saw that's built that looks like what I'm talking about. This the outside. You can tell the fencing is made out of the corrugated metal, which yeah. is virtually... You know, it does not need maintenance. The whole house looks like cement. The landscaping is simple and clean. So I'm not done. Like, I'm still working. I'm still getting rid of stuff. And then I started doing it with color. Like, I have knickknacks all over. Some of them I like. I started painting everything tan. People thought I was crazy. I'm like, and I had books and books and books. Some of them were just for looks. So one day, this was only like a week ago, you know, I said, no, that's it. I can do it with these books. And a friend of mine goes, Todd, are you sure you're not going crazy? So I have tons of shelves. I cleared 90% of the stuff off those shelves and gave all the books to charity. The books that I like. I go, what Mm -hmm. books do I really like? Come on, the others were just because books looked cool back then. You know, (laughs) like it did. It gave a room warmth. And I never lied to people. I was like, yeah, they're just books. I just, it makes the room feel warm. My friend thought I was crazy. He came back two weeks with his girlfriend maybe 40, 50 books on those shelves, or maybe 30 or 40 books, but they're the books that I would want to look at, like cool patio decks, uh, a a book about surfing, and the cool pictures of surfing. Now, people are looking at the books. Like, it sounds like, oh, of course, Mm -hmm. that's what you're going to say. No, like, now they come over because there's six books there leaning against the shelf. There's three over there. There's two there. And now people are taking the books off the shelves and they look so clean and so simple and, and, and the knickknacks that I have that mean something to me, they're there. They're not crushed in with other stuff. Oh, that was fun getting rid of those yeah. books. I love that. I mean, that's, I think, one of the great things about having stuff in your apartment is that when you have guests over, it starts a conversation. And when you have, like you said, 300 books on a shelf on a wall, there's nothing really to pick out. No. But like if you have 10 of your favorite books and you've read every one or maybe there's a couple that you, you mean to get to because it's a topic that interests you, I think those can actually start conversations and it can be a little bit more interesting right. than just having... Apparently like the average household has 300,000 items in it. Really? Yeah. What? Yeah. Which is hard to even imagine but I think if you were to go like even See, to my my parents probably have five hundred thousand and it, like they're, it's pretty organized. But like 
you just see every like wall space everywhere and it's like let's fill that with some stuff and there's gonna like 10 cow ornaments or whatever and then drawers are filled up everybody's got an attic or a basement filled with stuff or their grandparents stuff um it's 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 kind of crazy to think but i think it's nice to see now that people are starting to to look at it yeah. because i do think that there's a lot of there's you know we always talk that minimalism is the things are kind of like the first step and it's like exciting to to pare down the stuff but it definitely opens you up um and it helps you to focus on important things and not just worrying about like well like i got to redo this like i always thought about my friend's parents would always be renovating their house. Like they would always be adding a room on or redoing a bathroom. Everything was always about upgrades. Everything was changing. Everything was always trying to get better. And they never seemed to be just happy and be like, okay, we're done now. And I think that can, that can be a problem because you're not necessarily focusing on maybe relationships or experiences or living life. You're just focusing on, did you say that in the documentary? I'm trying to put more money. Oh, no. It's a it's a nice, polite way. Because, look, as you're doing this, there's still a kind way to deal with your, especially your mom and mom, mostly. Yeah. And I said, you know, I'm trying to, like, not make it about her directly, but I'm trying to put more money into experiences. So right. what could we do that would be an experience? Maybe instead of buying everybody gifts, mom, maybe. Because she always goes, oh, I don't want to spend money on a housekeeper the day after Thanksgiving. But what if uh, uh, Christmas? What if that meant, Mom, that instead of you towards the end of Christmas, you know what happens when it hits late at night and we're all hanging out and having a good time Christmas Eve and Christmas Day when I go back home. You think the next day you got to clean up. You know, what about instead of buying things that nobody needs, you have a housekeeper come the next day. So when it hits 11 o'clock at night and you're thinking, oh, we got to get up the next, that that's, to me, that's putting, that's a good, that's, first of all, that's giving a person money who needs it and has a business, a cleaning business, and that is also better than her buying shit for everybody that nobody needs, you know? So I try to tell her that way. And that, then that, I think she's realizing it because she was talking a bit about Christmas and she goes, I know you don't want any more <laughs> knickknacks. That's great. I go, mom, I love- but I still love Christmas. I go, mom, do you know that? I go, I want to be really clear with that. I, when I say stop with the presents and everything, not Christmas, I go, I love Christmas and I love being with my family at Christmas. Mm-hmm. We have our stuff sometimes, but overwhelmingly, like we have a good time. So I'm not negative about Christmas or anything. It's just the crap and all the stuff that comes along with it yeah know? i love the, the enthusiasm you have for minimalism has it's like when did you watch the the film and and when, how like long has it carried through you know i forgot how long ago i watched it it was probably seven months ago mm-hmm. eight months ago and it really did start me on a you know a path of you know oh when you mentioned tv mm-hmm. it's it's crazy once you do it how much st- other stuff it connects to. I mean, I got rid of a guest house I had in this period up in Lake Arrowhead. I told myself, you know what? It it pays for itself. And when I want to go up there, I just block it out for me. But when people rent it, it doesn't. Now, look, I'm not saying this is for everybody. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying me. Once I got rid of it, oh, I was just holding on to it as a thing. It didn't mean anything. Any of the items that meant something to me in the guest house are in my home now a dining room barn table, I brought it down. And all those memories, but I was just thinking it kissed goodbye the memories of that ha- house up in Lake Arrowhead, but it didn't. Mm-hmm. It was just a house. And once it's gone, I was so happy. But I got rid of cable too. And what I did notice, that's why when people ever shit on like, oh, today nobody does anything, you know, sometimes, no, you know, no. But what happened in the old day when people would just, you know, hang out together and talk and... Look, sometimes technology can lead to good old-fashioned talk-to-your-neighbor type of things. So, well, some people might shit all over, uh, you know, oh, with the internet and and now there's so much stuff. It's how you use it. Because I noticed something that's more positive now than TV. Uh, In 2018, we're basically going online when I have friends over and we're watching YouTube clips. Mm -hmm. Somebody has a... we, We go around in circles. It could be a music video and then it could be... Pretty much it's music videos a lot, but it could be, oh, this is an interesting thing about fish, that they, what they do underwater, this certain type of fish no one knew existed. We watch it, it's three to four minutes each, or, and then we talk about it. And I'm like, that's, that's great, that's what you want. Like we're watching stuff on television, and we're talking about it. Because, and we're utilizing modern technology to be able to do that. So, um, but, but to getting rid of cable for me, that was just a bill. That was mm. just a bill that I loved. I don't, I don't need cable. Now I don't even have the internet, which I know I need to get it back. 
but I wanted to just try. I've been oh, how long have you been doing that for? About five months. Really? And it's getting to be a little bit of a pain. Like, <laughs> we have a neighbor or two over that I'll use theirs. Yeah. But, um, it's that, funny. Like, yeah, I even do that with apps where I'll like maybe uh, delete apps or I'll hide it on my phone. But like eventually I'll find them. I'll figure out like a workaround. And I'm like, uh-huh. what am I doing? I'm like going through five different things just to get onto the internet. And like it's right. uh, our, our, we tend to fall back into these patterns pretty quickly. Yeah. But, but I will get back, proving that I don't have an obsession that will work in my not, in double negative, in my not favor. Yeah. For the cable, yes, I'm happy without it. Uh, the few times I want it, who cares? Uh, but uh, the, uh, the uh, internet, yeah, I, 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 you know, I already said one of, the, one of the kids that helps out on the podcast, because that's what they're great for. Not only their comedic ability, uh, but that work on there. But like, hey, would you uh, just get me cable again? I need cable, you know. <laughs> yeah, I told him that help. two days ago. I go, we need cable for the podcast studio at least. So. Yeah. But I just wanted to get rid of, you know, bills and stuff. And you know what else? You know, like Thanksgiving's coming around. You see a Thanksgiving, like a, a tablecloth. Oh, uh, no. You don't need it. The theme stuff. That's the worst. Yeah, you don't I'll need get, it. Like, I'll get a pumpkin. Because a pumpkin's like, yeah, a couple pumpkins. They're going to eventually. I agree. The same with me. I'll put a tablecloth on the table I have. Yeah. And then I'll put some pumpkins on the table if I'm having people over for that time of year or Thanksgiving. So I'm not void of being creative. I'm not. But I don't need. That's the shit. Oh, I used to go from the gym to the car wash and pass by a, a Ross. Yeah. During the holiday season. Oh, now it's like, no, <laughs> no, you don't need it. That's a lot of stuff for me. Yeah, know? that that is great. The seasonal stuff is like a whole other level because there's like, I mean, we used to have the Halloween stickers that you would put on the windows. You'd have it for every holiday that you would mm-hmm. you would get it. And it would just, it just adds up. That's just like extra yeah. shit in the, that you're storing in the attic. Even the way I did my, in front of my front door, I used to get hay and I'd get this and I'd get that. And, and it also, you, you do, you spend more time doing what you really want. And that's the, for me, it is the people coming over and feeling great around your house during the holidays. It feels great. It does. How can you still do that without buying shit? Uh, a, a, a certain color bulb can do a lot for mm. the romance of a room, you know? Uh, but outside, I have two pumpkins and a mum and some of those corn, you know, the, what's it, the dried corn. Yeah. Not, I used to have the big pumpkin and four bales of hay and I'd bring it home in my car and it, and for what? If, but again, I always end it by going, if you enjoy it, if you're mm-hmm. sitting listening to this and you're going, we do the four bales of hay and we do like six or seven pumpkins and probably about 10 or 12 mums and we enjoy it. Okay, I would ask yourself, honestly, you enjoy it? <laughs> yeah. And if the answer is yes, the getting it, the breaking it down, how much chaos does it cause in the house does you you know oh we got to get rid of the hay honestly not how it looks when it's done i get it when it's done you take a step back if you say no overwhelmingly it's a lot of joy for me to do that well then i would say i would recommend keep doing it but if you're able to go all right honestly eh, getting rid of it sucks and going to pick it up sex and vacuuming the car sucks and when the pumpkins rot and i gotta bring the trash cans over and remember to for me, it was like, no, I can, I can make it look Halloween-y, if that's a word, or Thanksgiving-y, uh, without buying a lot less stuff. You have a couple mindfulness practices. One specifically is the hot towel treatment. Mm-hmm. Uh, you want to talk about that? That It seems like something that you're very passionate about. It's something that's... Uh, how long have you been doing it for? Been doing it for about five years. Oh, really? But... I just started adding some, so so to your listeners, I'll explain, I think you already know. And it's not just doing it. I have very specifics that I think make it better. Mm-hmm. But I would imagine anybody doing any version of it is, is pretty good. But for me, like if some, and I'm not, I respect people to do yoga. I really do. What I'm saying for a lot of people, having even a, a, a touch of that spirituality to like cleanse their or, or, or uh, what is it called when you close your hands and just sort of uh, 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 meditation. Meditate, yeah. You know, look, this is not that, but it'll give you a taste, the mm-hmm. laziest way to get a taste of what it does. And then if you get the taste and you want to go crazy after that, you know, crazy in a good way of other types of meditation, oh, do it. But if this is all you do, that's my point. And so before, I used to do it just before dinners and it started as a joke. I would take the hot, the teapot and I would pour it over five or six hot wa- washcloths and I would go, oh, just like at a fancy restaurant. That would be the joke, you know? <laughs> yeah. And then... 
a lot of the kids that work, I say kids because some of them are 19 or 20, and I would do the hot washcloth thing, and they would love it. They'd be like, oh, can we do that again? So, mostly before dinner, but sometimes why not cherish having friends over? So what we'll do is we'll, I have a hot t- a teapot. That's how I do it. I take the washcloths. I put them on the kitchen counter, and I always tell everybody, when I bring this to you, you have to be very specific. It's going to be too hot. Now, I always say that, but for some reason, when people go to touch it, they go, oh, this is really hot. So I'm telling you now, you're going to be able to, and the reason is I explain to them if it's new people, my friends that already did it, they don't need to hear any of this. I go, because it has a very short uh, life of being hot. If you take hot water from the spigot, as hot as you can get it and put a washcloth under it and manage to wring it out a little bit and bring it, literally 20 seconds later, it's, it's not hot enough to get that experience. Mm-hmm. So I say, all I ask is from the time I start dropping them in front of you, because everyone will be like sitting, standing around the kitchen or at the dining room table getting ready to eat. From the minute I start dropping them, no talking. Just respect that, no talking. And turn the music off. Sometimes there'll be music in the, in the distance, very soft jazz, and I'm just laziness. I'll think, oh, that, that could be nice as we're doing this. Nope, turn it off. I'll start handing out the washcloths. Everyone, shh. Once I start handing them out, don't go, oh, this is hot. I, everything's happened. Everything I'm saying not to do, it's because someone will do it. Someone's girlfriend, my, someone's boyfriend that's never been there before. Or they'll go, oh, this feels good. No, no, shh. And I go, I'm not trying to be a Nazi with spirituality, but it's very important that we're quiet. The radio goes off. And over the years, we've added a few things that they've all added. You know, some of the people that work on the podcast. One is, go to the bathroom. I know it sounds stupid. If you have to pee, go go pee. Because a lot of times you, you have that happen where you think you don't have to. And then not only do you have to, but you're like, oh, really? And then we take our glasses and cell phones. You don't have to do this, but we like it. Because I notice people that have glasses that take them off. Now they have a, I say, go clean them with alcohol. I have like a spray bottle. We'll just take the same towel, pass it around, clean all our cell phones out, put them over. And then we put the hot towel on our face. I say, if you're done before everybody else and you take the hot towel off your face, Look around the room, see where everybody else is at. We'll end this. Sometimes everyone has their washcloth off, but there's one person with still leaning back on their face. Let that person be there. And when everyone's done, I go, I'll break the silence. And everybody puts it on their face. It, you don't have to say, take a deep breath. You will. The heat forces you to take a deep breath in. You will just do it. No one has to tell you. And let it out. And then the last thing I say is, and now here comes the other part. That was the spiritual part of cleansing spiritually. Literally wipe the filth off your hands. And when everyone takes it because it's still hot, mm-hmm. take it off down your both arms, both hands. And then I walk around collecting them and I throw them into the basket. And what I always tell myself after I do that is, it's, it's weird that I do it and then I'm sort of aggressive with myself. Well, I go, oh, what? Were you just going to sit down and plow food into your mouth? Because that's so cliche. Oh, don't take food for granted. We all take it for granted, including me. Is that what you're going to do? Oh, here's the day and I'm doing this. And then we come home and then we cook food. Everyone sit down. We just start plowing food in their mouth. No, no, you weren't going to do that, were you? And I'm able to go, I thought about it, but no. I'm going to stop, 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 stop. And we're going to do this hot towel thing. And when it's done, we're going to cherish each other. This is a big deal to hang out with your friends and have dinner. We're just hanging out without dinner. And we're not just going to start plowing food into our mouths when it happens to be when we do it before dinner. And we're going to stop. And we're going to, this is something we take for granted, but we're not going to. And every time when we eat, it's like, wow. Now we like doing it. Just for nothing. We're just hanging out at the house. We're like, in the middle of nothing. We could be six people hanging out. We're like, hey, you want to do hot washcloths? It's always amazing. It's always amazing. So for a lot of people, especially when they get into meditation, they need to have somebody guide them through because their thoughts are so chaotic. But to have, so sometimes, you know, a teacher might even have you focus on your breath. But then to have something like a washcloth, which kind of, and the heat and the entire experience of it, I think does... Uh, I've only done it a couple of times, but it's certainly, you can, you can almost like feel it when you're talking about it, that this is something that would be like an amazing experience. And if you were trying to get anybody into a yoga and I have, I have not taken the process to that, but if you were trying to get anyone into meditation or yoga, 
this would be the first experience to go, I'm going to tell you, give you a smidge of what it feels like to clear your head a little, the easiest way. Because to me, that would be the easiest way. And if that's intriguing to them, if they go, wow, that felt good. Hey, that might feel good. And that's all they ever do. But if there's any way to talk someone into doing meditation or yoga, the hot washcloth would be the first thing you'd want to tell them to do. And because if they, if they really go, wow, all I did was shut up for a minute. Whew. Wow, that felt really good. And then maybe if they, then that would be the path to them taking it to another level if they wanted to. Have any of these mindfulness practices, whether it be like that, that hot towel type, type, type treatment or minimalism spilled into the work that you do uh, in terms of, I imagine there's an element native to stand-up comedy or any kind of creative form that is about curation. That's about, hey, let's just throw a bunch of shit at the wall, see what sticks, and then it's going to be the process of eliminating the shit, finding the good stuff, and, and seeing where it goes. Has that always been a process? Has the, have these mindfulness practices helped at all? In my stand-up, probably indirectly it's had to, but nothing... Nothing too direct in my stand-up. I mean, except that I'm the same way backstage at comedy clubs. I create a atmosphere, but I've always I've always done that. I mm -hmm. I always uh, transform my hotel rooms to a to a tranquil state. But that's about. But I always did that. Mm -hmm. You know, always. Uh, I have ways of making my hotel room just seem like. Just very and it's very easy and it really involves i always bring a, I, I use stick candles for what it's worth now i'm not mm. I, I used to be like i would light if i had a party light like 50 candles all over the place and there's no doubt that looks can look amazing but maybe it had to do with a little bit of the minimalization now i only use stick candles you know what stick candles are tapered candles the longer candles yeah, yeah. the reason i like those is because the, the wax melts away from the wick that way that's why the flame is always so much bigger because it's always a really big flame on a stick candle now like at my house i'll have three three or four that's it and when you walk into someone's house and it's dark and there's one on the dining room table there's the fire pit of the dining room table there's one in the kitchen and there's any any sitting area and in the dining and then in the living room i have one on the coffee table people congregate around it they'll congregate around a stick candle more than just a regular candle and, and i do that on the hotel i bring a few stick candles and i will create a living room area in a hotel with the few chairs that are there even if it means i s steal a few from the lobby and create a circle put a candle in it that and i bring gels and you know what gels are they're like gels are like they come in a sheet they're about like two feet by Two feet. You mean like a color gel? Color gel. Yeah, yeah, you for can lights. cut them. You know, I have little cups that I'll like take scotch tape and I throw them over the bulb. Hmm. Now I'm using blue. So I'll have like a, just a, the gels can be cracked and shoved in your bag and they still go over the light bulb and they'll make the room like a cool color. So I'll put a few gels around my room. It doesn't take a lot. Some people go, oh my God, you travel with gels. I go, it takes me no time. You know, just gel a few lights and then light a candle, put on some really cool music, have it real dark and swanky. People come back to smoke pot mm -hmm. in the room and it feels really good. And I just started adding this and it's crazy. Christmas lights. I started with white, but it was too bright. Mm -hmm. So now I bring blue for some reason, blue. Literally just bunch them around the base of a lamp. And at first it looks like, oh, but when it's dark and they're just there. So I'll have like just maybe two six foot strands of Christmas lights. The blue strand, you know, blue over there, blue over there, dark in the room. I love that because, it, well, if you're traveling a lot, mm -hmm. that can be a drain. And to have, you know, a little almost sanctuary, mm -hmm. some peacefulness when you go back to the hotel room. It's so a lot. It, it doesn't feel sterile. No. And if you're in a nice hotel, it makes it nicer. If you're mm. in a, you know, maybe it's like, you know, I don't even mean at this point in my career, I'm not staying in Super 8s. But you could be at the Marriott Courtyard and they're not the most soul-filled rooms in the world, the Marriott Courtyard. You have a little kitchen and it's nice. But then you walk in, it doesn't just make it a little better. That's my favorite thing to say. It's not a little better. People, other comedians that are staying three doors down come into my room and they're like, this is crazy. And whenever anybody goes, hey, do you have any of those gels? I go, oh, I love it. I'm like, yes. Most people don't ask for it. Here you go. I'll give someone a row of Christmas lights. I'll be like, if that's, my friend said, that's been in my bag for the last year. I use it every room I go into. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, your question was, did it spill into my comedy? You know, maybe just the atmosphere backstage or at the hotel. Yeah. But I don't think in my literal act, except I do talk about, you know what? Maybe it has. I, I started talking about, 
like, I know this sounds crazy, but like, you know, whatever it is, if grilled cheese sandwiches aren't your thing, maybe it's peanut butter and jelly. So if you're listening to this right now and you're thinking, I actually don't like grilled cheeses, it doesn't matter. There's something you like that will be appropriate. So like grilled cheese sandwiches are a nickel and they are as good as lobster. I talk about this in my act now. I go, they're as good as lobster. Let's not make pretend, well, they're close. No, no. If a grilled cheese sandwich was the same price as lobster and from a little kid, you always knew that, like, can I get a grill? No, you can't get grilled cheese sandwiches. They're too expensive. You would have the reverence for them that people have for lobster or expensive food. You, does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So when I tell the audience, I'll be like, I know everyone's sitting here going, yeah, yeah, we get it. Grilled cheese sandwiches are great. But you don't treat them great. You don't eat, you, no one eats lobster while they're watching TV. You know what I mean? Like just putting it in their mouth or, or just, oh, yeah, and they're put because it's lobster. So when you're, but, and I always say it sarcastically to the audience. I go, oh, please tell me you're not deciding what's worth celebrating by the market cost. Are you? Cause I started to, and that's a shit life. Mm-hmm. Well, why would we set the table nice for grilled cheese sandwiches? They're affordable. Does that sound like who you want to be? Oh, we'll decide how much it costs before we sell it. And I, that's what, so I tell people, like, if you're going to eat grilled cheese sandwiches, set the table. Do what you would do for lobster. Turn the lights down. Light a candle. Whatever you, like, they're just as good. Not, not just like some bullshit phrase. Like, grilled cheese sandwiches, they're, they're crunchy. They're cheesy. They're food. They're candy. They're everything. I did it this week with peanut butter and jelly. I love peanut butter and jelly. And I realized, yeah, everybody loves it. But it's, it's better than you think it is. So this week we had people over and I had like, I bought this stuff. It's fluffy peanut butter. And if you've never had it, you'll be addicted to it. Bought a few types of bread. Fluffy peanut butter? Yeah. It's fluffy peanut butter. It's Where do you get it? They used to have it at Vaughn's. Now I can only get it at Target. But it's whipped peanut butter. Wow. Not creamy. Creamy you can get anywhere. It's whipped peanut butter. So it's easier butter. to spread. It's, a li- it's easier to oh, spread. Man. And even though part of the charm of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich is some of the peanut butter getting caught on the roof of your mouth. I get it. Who, <laughs> who gives a shit? It's better. Yeah. And we made peanut butter and jelly sandwich with toast. We made peanut butter and jelly sandwich with waffles. Uh, we Some people toasted their peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Some people didn't. But we made one or two each, and we all sat down at the table. And I go, like, treat it like it's $500. And someone goes, oh, you never had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Well, they're $500. But, oh, my God, the cold jelly and the creamy fluffy peanut butter and the crunch of the bread oh once you eat one you'll wish you could afford to have one every day eat it like that may pretend that that it's and then you will not be disappointed you'll take one bite into it you'll be like wow and then try to eat them with that even though they're a nickel right they're a nickel it's really about appreciating what you have right which sounds cliche, but yeah, like why are we not treating these? And I'm not saying every time you have to eat a grilled cheese sandwich or a peanut butter and jelly could be like that, but why not sometimes? You don't have to celebrate it because it's absurdly expensive. You I know? feel like we're often like overstimulated. Like every, even I, I find myself certainly falling into this where it's like, uh, well, I'm going to eat lunch. I better cue something up on Netflix so I can watch something while I eat. And it's like you have to always be doing two or three things at once. I'm catching myself with that. Yeah. I try to be on the better end of it. That's why I don't ever shit on technology because technology can lead us to good spirituality. You know, technology does not have to be all, but like, you know, but so when I say, I hope this is sort of talking about what you're talking about. When mm-hmm. You know, some people go, let's have a no cell phone night. Mm-hmm. For me, that doesn't involve no cell phones at the table. Now, I want them in their pockets. I don't want them on the table because they look ugly. Everyone's cell phones all over the table. But, and I ask, I go, look, we're on the honor system. And I always say this half, I'm, I'm kidding in the way that I say it, but all my friends know me. I go, we're on the honor system. I just don't want, me too, me too, looking at tweets. Tweets, emails, Instagram. Tweets, email, Instagram. I'm asking people not to do that. But to me, the most spiritual night does not mean putting your cell phone away because sometimes having the recorder on there to be able to have an idea and just say it into your phone clears your head. Mm -hmm. So for me to have no one be able to have their cell phone, just for me, some people, maybe it is. Leave your cell phone in the car. Everyone leave them over in the kitchen. If that's what you want, that's great. But for me... I didn't want that because I know for a lot of times that recorder helps people be more in the moment, be able to turn to their, hey, don't forget tomorrow to do this or here's a funny idea. Maybe it involves showing people pictures on your cell phone. Well, that, do I have a problem with people passing around photo albums? And that's what a phone is today. As long as it's using the phone to 
make it a better evening, you know, not just looking at our Instagrams, not just, you know, pulling back. So that's what no, no cell phone night means to me. It means don't use your phone to just get away. But if it means using it and, or maybe taking a picture of everyone or that, that, that's what I mean. But you're not just scrolling. If I see someone over in the corner and I'll be like, hey, or they'll, tell, do, yeah. they'll do it to me sometimes. And I don't mind. They'll do it to me. They always think I'm going to be offended because I'm the one implementing these rules. But I've had people go, Todd, I go, thank you. Thank you. Meaning I'm not above it. I'm not above it. You're right. I'm not using my phone to interact. I'm using it to just pull back. And yeah, go this into is definitely it. a new thing. It's it's something that we're all learning how to bring into our right. lives and not let it overrun. Right. And, and it is. It's very easy to criticize people, but everybody's looking down at their phones. But it's like, I mean, we're all prey to it. We all, I mean, right. at least most of us uh, who are connected, who have smartphones, which is, I would say, probably 90% of people living in America, if probably more, um, we have to rethink the way that we're using right. it, especially when we're with other people, but also when we're by ourselves. Because I mean, what, especially if we want to be productive and if we're ambitious, if we have like things that we want to achieve in life and, and we have certain goals that we want to accomplish, you can't just be consuming all the right. time. And, and, the, and the only thing bad about, you know, let's call it social media technology, you're in control of, including me. So I don't think it just has to be bad. That's why when people go, oh, with the mom, hey, I talked about YouTube before. We are sitting around watching music from the 70s, from the 60s, from the 40s, and then commenting on it because of modern technology. It can be a beautiful thing. And the thing, you know, and the clutter that you can get rid of because of, you know, the way we can store things now. So I don't, I think that, uh, that and the phone, like, look, the phone can give you your freedom. The, the Anything bad about the phone, and I get it, there is the bad side of maybe a phone sometimes. But I think overwhelmingly, the bad part can be controlled by you, like getting off your phone when you go through a checkout stand. Talk to the person. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's a bad habit that you have with a phone that you want to get rid of. But I think that technology can help us. I mean, I, I talk to my brother and my mom more now with the, with the phone in the last, you know, whatever, since I've had my iPhone, or whatever, 15 years or whatever, 20 years, than I used to. To be in traffic and be able to have an hour conversation with my brother or my mom, that's valuable time. Mm -hmm. To be able to go from the airport and get a car home to my house, but then have cleared up 15 things, literally seven through a text. Uh, that's a great idea. Let's do it Monday. Boom, done, cleared. As opposed to going into my house, especially when I was in a relationship and having to go to listen to my messages or deal with things. So the phone can, if you use it properly, it can, it can enhance life amazingly with just a little bit of discipline where it's negative. But I do not want to be one of those people. Oh, the problem today is, oh, stop. Bl no, no, they, 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 you're in control of the bad part of that. You're mm -hmm. the only, you're, matter of fact, I like to, you're the only bad part of that. <laughs> you're the only bad part of that. You're the bad part of that. The part that takes a little self-control that you won't implement and you want to blame it on the technology. I mean, I'll make an absurd analogy. That's like going, the problem with light bulbs are you can do heroin on them. I just learned that, that someone had missing light bulbs when their roommate in college and they found out that they use light bulbs to do, well, that's not the light bulbs fault. Right. That's, you know, a shitty analogy, but you get what I mean. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it is very easy to cast the blame. Um, but I think, yeah, I think far too little people are willing to just take responsibility yeah. and say, you know what, maybe I do have a problem with looking at my phone. What can I do to fix it? Right. And, and then utilize it for all the great things it can exactly. do. Exactly. Totally. And you know, my, my pic, I, I print out every year a photo album. And now that I know that I'm going to do it, you know that one of the things in that photo album would just be obviously literal pictures that I've taken throughout that one year. But, and then some of it would be pictures of items that we talked about that mm -hmm. I would get rid of. And some of them now I know they're tweets, the tweet that inspires me or makes me laugh or a text from a friend that, wow, I'm going to really appreciate seeing that two years later that, you know, Rory Scovel sent me a funny text. Uh, and you see how much it means to you even two years later. Pick up a, one of my photo albums from two years ago. And then, wow. And then once you see that, oh, like that really, th then you do more of it. Now I'm constantly taking screenshots of texts and tweets. So every year I print out this book. That's because of modern technology. A book that the pictures won't fall out of and you put them in, the, you slide them in. It's on the page, the photo. And there's pictures and there's items that I had wanted to get rid of that remind me of the item. Or like I say now, tweets or text or in this book. That's all because of modern technology. And that book is on my coffee table. And people look at it. That's my, that's technology, you know, just 
put printing out a good old fashioned photo album. You did men- mention something uh, that reminded me about. Uh, a recent album that you and Blake Wexler created, 12 years of voicemails from Todd Glass to Blake Wexler. Uh, one of my favorite things, but also, a, I think, an example of when to hold on to things and when holding on to things actually can be meaningful. Yeah, well, that, that, the fact that Blake had saved all those was because a lot of people told me, oh, I'm saving your voicemails. But then they go, you know, you go, oh, I thought I had them, but I didn't. But he came over to my house. He had mentioned... Uh, that he was saving them. Uh, and I think I wanted to still be true in the CD that there was a period when I knew that he was saving them. But I mentioned that. I go, I know mm-hmm. you're saving these now. Thanks for ruining my best part of my day was leaving you messages. Now I'm worried that you're going to save them and then that I might be bombing. So <laughs> thanks for ruining that. But it didn't because I wanted it to be in the present. And then he came over to my house one day and he had them. And right, listening to those, some of them were mostly just silly, but sometimes there were some poignant things. I remember when he broke up with his girlfriend, I had some words of wisdom for him because I knew it really crushed him. Mm-hmm. And also um, uh, just some other, you know, what were some other things that on there? Oh, after, the day after uh, Trump won. <laughs> some of them are very short. Some of them are very short. Literally, I go, oh my God, Blake. I go, this is worse than 9-11. <laughs> <laughs> Boo! <laughs> we put a beep in there, even though there's no beep in there. I figured, yeah, you because did. It's yeah, yeah. It does add the comedic. It adds, it's the, it's the, the punch at the end. It's yeah. the, it's the uh, <laughs> yeah, it is. But those things, him saving those, that was, you know, that was like, you're right. That was something worth holding on to. And now it's on a, on a CD available on iTunes. Yeah. It, no, it's, it's, it's really, it's clever, but I also, uh, I do like the idea of holding on to those messages, whether it's from like family or friends. Like I always thought it'd be great to record podcasts with my family, not to release, but just to have that conversation recorded, audio, video, whatever. Um, probably audio would be better because like I don't know if my parents would be that <laughs> it would be good with all the camera stuff. But it's nice to be able to have those. They're really memories that you're holding on to, right? right? You know, you saying that is going to make me follow through with this. I thought. You know, when my dad died when I was 24, I didn't, I had one voicemail message from him. I had, uh, I did have, they had voice, I didn't have an answering machine at that time. There was already voicemail, which was like a big deal that you didn't have to. Mm-hmm. And I had one from him and you know, you're 24. You, 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 I didn't realize how much I would want it when I was older and somehow it got misplaced. But I have a message from my mom I did save. It's on, it's in my phone and it's on my hard drive at home. But I thought about if I don't have my mom on my podcast, I'm going to regret that for the rest of my life. And so I haven't told her that for that reason, but I said, well, I'm, I'm trying to get her and her husband, Steve, to come out and visit me. And then while they're out there, I definitely want her to come into the studio. Some of it is I'm afraid the story she's going to have. Like everyone on my podcast will love it because there's stuff they don't know about me. Yeah. And I'm willing to forgo whatever it might be. It's nothing horrendous, but it's embarrassing probably, you know. What what did I do when I was little? <laughs> how, how little was I when my mom knew, oh, I know who I'm starting to form who I am. Like what was I like? So I definitely want to have my mom on my podcast and talk to her for that would two, be a two hours. Of, that and then I'll have that forever. Yeah. You can look back at it. Yeah. Because, I mean, a lot of times it's like it's nice to be able to go back and listen to a voicemail that that's short and quippy. But to be able to look back at something that's long form, that's video footage or whatever, I think it definitely it, it's it, it fills you with good feelings. Yeah, it does. It really it fills me with good feelings even thinking about it. Yeah. And I did it with my brother and his wife when I was home at their house in Newtown Square about last Thanksgiving. Uh, I turned on just my phone and we didn't have a I didn't have a podcast but I go hey I, there's no podcast today but I'm gonna I'm here with my brother and his wife and you want to talk to them for a little while and we just made like a 40 minute thing into my phone and I did end up you know releasing it as a podcast that week as a what I call a no show show and even that mm. was like real interesting and fun yeah. to talk to them well Todd thank you so much for doing this podcast I'm a big fan of stand up everything that you do the podcast is hilarious uh, I really appreciate you being on the show um, do you have any final words and where should we send people? Well, final words again, thank you because you know, like when Blake told me you're from Philly, where are you from in Philly? Are you I'm f- from Jersey. I went to temple for a couple mm-hmm. years and I'm friends with a lot of the comedians from Philly. Right. Cause Blake said you might've met Matt, uh, 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 or, you know, over the years. I'm, uh, cause I was telling him, I mean, I was going off. I really liked the documentary and it made my life better. You know, and I know I said that up front, but I'll repeat it. Like it really, 
you know, I mean, it just really, it really made my life better, a lot better, and my a cleaner head. So I really appreciate that, and it's fun thank to you. sit down. I could talk to you for another three hours. Yeah, I we really could. could. I wish I had nowhere to be. So thank you for that. I definitely appreciate that. I mean, that's a huge deal. What a, what a, I mean, it, you're, you have influenced my way of life just it's tremendously. Amazing. It's, it, it is amazing, you know, all from a documentary that, uh, that I thought, you know, I wasn't even sure if I wanted to watch, you know, and my friend goes, you want a mantra? Yeah, you'll at least leave it with a few mantras to, to help you declutter. Because other than that, it wouldn't have helped me that much. I, it's so weird, though, that I asked that literally. I go, does it have any mantras or something? Right. So thank you for that. And then last words, um, you know, I, always, I got my Netflix special, which is on iTunes, which is on Netflix, obviously, right now. Just dropped a few months ago. And my podcast, The Todd Glass Show, and, you know, everything else is good. Awesome, man. Thanks for doing this. Thank you. Matt, Matt, Matt. So I am uh, literally a half an hour away from your house, and I realized something. You asked me, did any of the minimaliz- uh, minimalizing cross over into my career? It's the essence of what you asked. And I realized, of course, I gave you a shitty answer because uh, it absolutely has. Since I did my Netflix special and I started utilizing the band, I really wanted to just do that on the road, travel with a band, and travel with a tech person and, and make it some, you know, crazy stand-up show uh, that would be different than anything I've ever done before. And once I started minimalizing and getting rid of crap I didn't need, it really made me be able to focus on doing that show and bringing that show on the road. So it directly has affected me in a really, really positive way. I don't know, maybe I didn't really need to call you. And I'm going to sell my legs. I realize I don't need them anymore. All right, that's your...